Hello again. Ancient sources, both Greek and Latin, contain many references to this conjunctional great year. Aristotle, the other giant of Greek philosophy, seems to have been much concerned with the theory as well. Unfortunately, the treatise in which it was discussed, the Protrepticus, has been lost. In the Latin world, we find that Cicero was also much interested in the doctrine. He refers or alludes to it in at least six of his works. In ancient literature, we also find miscellaneous lists of periods allegedly understood as great years in the Platonic sense. But these clearly do not correspond to it in reality. They include short luni solar periods, as for instance the so-called Saros cycle, this famous astronomical cycle of about 18 years and 11 days enabled the ancients to predict with a fair degree of accuracy the return of solar and lunar eclipses. The same lists also mention truly gigantic world cycles. These include a cycle of 120,000 years ascribed to the legendary Orpheus and even a period of 3,600,000 uh, years ascribed to a certain Cassandra. But it goes without saying that these kinds of great years do not have anything to do with Plato's conjunctional great year. But we do also find in ancient literature a wide variety of sources discussing the great year in Plato's sense. What this material reveals, however, is an increasing tendency among authors to move the original theory, which is fundamentally a problem of mathematical astronomy, into the realm of astrological speculations and beliefs in the doctrine of the eternal return. It thus became a habit with many scholars to adopt extremely deterministic views on the universe. They affirmed that cycle after cycle, great year after great year, every event in the world here below would happen again in exactly the same order as in the previous cycle. This tendency is best illustrated by this passage taken from the Naturalis, naturalis Quaestiones of the Latin Stoic philosopher Seneca. Here, the Great Year Doctrine is said to be derived from the speculations of the Babylonian priest and scientist Berossus, and linked to apocalyptic events such as universal floods and conflagrations. I quote, Both flood and conflagration will occur when it seems best to God for the old things to be ended and better things to begin. Water and fire dominate earthly things. From them is the origin, from them is the death. Therefore, Whenever a renewal for the universe is decided, the sea is sent against us from above, like raging fire when another form of destruction is decided upon. Berossus, who translated Belus, says that these catastrophes occur with the, movement, the movements of the planets. Indeed, he is so certain that he assigns a date for the conflagration and the deluge. The rest of the passage explains that a universal conflagration will take place when all the planets come together under the sign of Cancer, the place of the summer solstice. The universal flood will occur when they all meet under the sign of Capricorn, which is the place of the winter solstice. Many other references of the same kind could be supplied to show that the assumption that the general conjunction of the planets was the cause of the floods, conflagrations and other events in this world had become the norm among the principal schools of thought in late antiquity. The only serious opposition to this belief in the absolute power of the stars was to come from Christian milieus, with intellectuals such as Origen or Saint Augustine. These authors thoroughly condemned this view. In particular, they emphasized that such a periodical recurrence of events was wholly incompatible with Jesus Christ's incarnation. In the City of God, we find an interesting passage in which Augustine seeks to ridicule his adversaries on this issue. 
At the same time, he tries to justify the famous phrase, there is nothing new under the sun, as uttered by Solomon in the Bible. His line of argument consists in imagining a model in which the philosopher Plato would find himself in an endless repetition of cycles, constrained to teach the same things to the same students, with absolutely no change from one cycle to the next. Relying on the sacred text, he concludes, I quote, Heaven forbid, I say, that we should believe that. For Christ died once for all sins, but rising from the dead, he dies no more, and death shall no longer have dominion over him. It's certainly not by chance that Augustine puts Plato at the center of his example. The fame of the passage on the great year in the Timaeus led most people in antiquity and in later periods to hold him responsible also for all sorts of beliefs, of beliefs in line with the theory of planetary conjunctions. At the same time, we can measure the degree of distortion which the original conception had undergone over the centuries. It is quite evident that Plato himself would never have subscribed to the rigid and deterministic view denounced by Augustine. In the next unit, which is devoted to reception of the Great Year Doctrine in the Eastern and Western Middle Ages, we shall see that another series of amalgamations and confusions affected the original theory, distorting it almost beyond recognition.